Hi, friends. Um, thanks for being here. My name is Josh Scott. I'm the lead pastor at Grace Point Church in Nashville. And before we... Oh, thank you. Wow. Thanks. <laughs> so uh, I want to introduce our, our panelists here before we jump into the conversation. We'll start down on the end with Amber Cantorna. Amber is a national speaker, an author, and columnist, and she, her, are her pronouns. Sarah Cunningham, a Free Mom Hugs founder, an author, LGBTQ ally, and pronouns are she, her. Liz Dyer, Mama Bear's founder, LGBTQ ally, and her pronouns are she, her. Um, Kayla Bonewell, Bonniewell, Bonniewell sorry, uh, queer UCC pastor at Church of the Open Arms, Oklahoma City, and Cathedral of Hope, Oklahoma City, pronouns she, her. And, yep. And Stan Mitchell, a pastor, founder of Grace Point Church, co-founder of Everybody Church, an LGBTQ ally. His pronouns are he, him. Let's welcome them all. So, friends, uh, two years ago, if you can believe the last Wild Goose was two years ago, two years ago, we were here at Wild Goose talking about the importance of open and affirming communities, congregations. Have we made any progress in the last two years uh, seeing this movement happen in America. And feel free, whoever wants to jump in, feel free. Liz, I thought you had a, a great answer to this a moment ago. From where I sit, <clears throat> I don't see a lot of progress happening. Um, I look at the largest denominations and it appears to me they've just dug their heels in and are staying where they're at. Um, I think there are some more non-affirming churches that are non-denominational popping up around and people are forming different kinds of communities. But we were talking today about how the United Methodist Church is probably gonna split over this issue. And it seems a little ludicrous to me that in 2021 with everything we know and have learned and put out there and all the resources we have and LGBTQ people living openly, authentically, that a church is going to split, that a denomination is going to split over this issue. It just, it, it baffles my mind. Can you repeat the question? I want to hear the question. Do, do, have we made progress in... And the uh, we is who? Uh, the royal we? Okay. Um, <laughs> just American so, Christianity? But to imagine? your point, I was thinking the exact opposite. Because culture writ large is making progress. The question is, is religious bodies, are religious bodies making progress? And specifically, is Christianity making progress? I was just thinking this morning about that letter I wrote to the serendipity doodah people um, in the wake of the nightclub shooting in Florida, Pulse. Was that 2016? Mm -hmm. That sounds right. I looked at that letter last night that I wrote specifically and I said to the 1,100 mama bears, 2016. How many mama bears now in that group? Almost 30,000. Okay. Mm, almost 30,000. So progress is being made. Is it being made in the institutional church? That's another question. And that is what I was thinking about is, you know, is the church as a whole making progress on including LGBTQ people fully and affirming and celebrating them. I guess I was thinking of it that way because that's what I want to see happen. I'm in Oklahoma City, and in the last two years, there's been one more United Methodist Church that has become reconciling and one more UCC church that has become open and affirming and several more churches that um, pay their fee and come to the Pride Parade and represent, but it's not a lot. Would you mind to just real quickly explain for maybe somebody who's not familiar with the term reconciling? Uh, reconciling is a United Methodist term for open and affirming. Uh, however, it doesn't mean that you could be uh, ordained as a queer pastor or have your wedding in that church. Um, it means that they are as far progressive as they can be under the constraints that the denomination puts upon them. I'd like to add to what Stan and my friend Liz said that, you know, so many advancements have been made. We have marriage equality, which I thought I would never see uh, in 2015 in the state of Oklahoma. 
Uh, but we also have conversion therapy, which is still legal, sought out, and paid for in the same state that is even being debated. We have the uh, Equality Act, where my son could be denied housing, health care, even refused service in a public space simply for who he is. So as advanced as we're getting, it's almost like to the same degree, uh, the negative has just doubled down as well. So. What do you yeah, think, I was, Amber? I was going to say the same thing. I think with the if you haven't watched Pray Away, the conversion therapy documentary they just released, you know, we've got people on the conservative side that are like, oh, this isn't harmful. And then we've got people on the liberal side that don't even realize it's happening still and that this even exists. And so conversion therapy is still legal for minors in almost 30 states. So we still have a lot of work to be done in those states and, and legal everywhere for people that aren't licensed therapists that are under a religious exemption and still practicing in their churches under, you know, cloaked names. Mm -hmm. And if you're not familiar with conversion therapy, it's also referred to as reparative therapy, is really any type of therapy, practice, or prayer that would try to change a queer person into a straight person. And um, it's shame-based ministry. Uh, as long as there's transphobia, hom homophobia, there will be some form of this I want to say ministry, but it's not at all. It's dangerous, it's deadly, and um, that's why we need people like you to um, speak out about it. So, You know, it may be helpful to also talk about a little bit about the difference. I mean, how many of you have ever been by a church and seen all are welcome on the sign? How many of you saw that on the sign and went, eh, probably not? Right, so it may be important for us to talk about what are, the, what are the differences in, say, a church that is fully affirming and inclusive and churches that may say they're friendly or welcoming, and, and what are the differences in those, and why is it really, really important to be very clear about being open, affirming, and inclusive? There is a big difference, and, um, but it can often be subtle. Uh, because of the way people initially respond or greet LGBTQ people or even people that are um, supporters and affirming of LGBTQ people. Uh, the bottom line is basically, can an LGBTQ person do everything in this church and in this denomination that a straight person or a cisgender person can do? And if they can, then the church is fully inclusive and affirming. If they can't, then it's something less. It may be friendly, it may be what they want to consider accepting, but there will be special restrictions for LGBTQ people. And who wants to invest in a church where you got special restrictions put on you? What are some questions somebody, if they, if they want to know where the church stands, what would be some questions people could ask the church leadership? Um, and I would, uh, <laughs> it's been a running joke on social media lately, but if the pastor invites you to coffee, that's probably a bad sign. <laughs> Um, but like, I invite question. all my new visitors to coffee. <laughs> I love coffee too. We just it, other people are making it tough for us. We need to, we need to reclaim it. coffee. Um, what, what are some some questions that would sort of get this all out in the open? I have two. Yeah, go ahead. May say that um, two questions, and they're yes or no. One, do you honor same-sex marriage as holy? Two. Will you allow my transgender friend to work in the nursery if they feel so called? Easy yes or no. I would say not necessarily questions to ask, but things to look for is, do they have a clear statement on their website that is easy to find, that's accessible, that's explicit and obvious? If not, they're probably not affirming. And then what does their staff look like? Are they representing diversity in their staff? in their children's ministry, in their youth ministry, in their music ministry, and what does that look like? Are there people of color? Are there LGBT people? What, you know, and that's what, because I'm in an interracial marriage, so those are things that we look for when we walk into a church. If they're primarily, if they say they're inclusive, but they're still all white and straight, we don't feel super comfortable there, you know? And so we keep looking. So those are things that we look for very quickly. In this day and age, hopefully not for forever, but I look for a rainbow flag outside the church, on the Facebook cover picture, on the website. Hopefully one day we'll be so open and affirming that you won't have to advertise it, but right now that's what I look for. Stan, you got anything? I think, I think the rainbow flag's really important. Um, I, and 
Of course, a lot of Grace Pointers sitting out here. I was the lead pastor at Grace Point before Josh. Now I'm the founding pastor, which I still go to Grace Point. He's my pastor. I love being founding pastor because it's kind of like being the Queen of England. No responsibility, lots of... <laughs> just sit back at the back and get lots of glory with no responsibility. So it's a lovely a founder place. Too. We, um, we early on, and I see the folks that were in this conversation, we said, you know, we really want to make this plain. So we said we are fully affirming, and that means that a transgender person duly qualified can take my pa place as senior pastor. Yeah. Anything shy of that is not, f and that's an easy statement to make. So I, I wouldn't even ask just can they be in the nursery, can they be the lead pastor here. I think language is really important. I think we have to use all of the language, but like with all language, we keep refining it. You know, a lot of people make fun of the, you know, trying to be politically correct, but I think the the underbelly of trying to be politically correct as words is we realize that language has the capacity to carry things. It carries baggage. It accrues baggage. And one of the things I remember hearing Philip Yancey years ago say that is good about language is sometimes when you can't get rid of the idea or the baggage, you can take the word and jettison that word and start with a fresh word. And so that, that is something we need to do. And we finally got to the place where uh, inside Grace Point, we were like, you know, all of the friendly, inclusive, affirming, celebrating, if, if you're not careful, it starts c sounding like we're being magnanimous and it's almost self-congratulatory. And we finally figured out that the word internally to use and even to cast was repentant. We felt like we weren't doing something great, we were stopping doing something awful. So we didn't need congratulated and I think I think instead of us stepping out and saying, look at how generous, we're, we're not being generous. Mm -hmm. We're not doing something wonderful. We're just stopping doing something awful. And that's called repentance. And I think that's the best word for us to use. And I think that clarifies to a great degree. I love that. And I think it's uh, the kind of attitude that could um, draw some people back uh, to church because so many people have just left the institution because it's just been so painful. Yeah, and as you were saying that, I was thinking that people who occupy our social context, who look a lot like us, we show up an hour late to the party claiming we threw it. Yeah, exactly. And that's not, what, that's not what's happening here. So I, I agree. I think language is really important. Um, for folks here who are maybe they're part of a faith community and um, that community is not yet open and affirming, and they're wondering how might we begin this conversation, and maybe they're here and they're not in an explicit leadership role, how can they begin to initiate some of this movement that needs to happen? I think stories are really important. I think stories have the power to influence hearts and minds more than any kind of debate over theology. I feel like you kind of have to start with stories um, and then move to theology later. Um, because the stories are what kind of grips the heart, you know, and, and tell your stories. Bring people that are willing to share their stories. Um, I do a lot of speaking at churches and sharing my story because it resonates with people, you know. Evangelical background, dad focused on the family, Adventures and Odyssey kid, homeschool kid, came out as gay, lost everything. Like, that resonates, and so I tell that story because people have experienced that. That's what they're experiencing in their churches. And whether you know it or not, you've got pe LGBT people in your congregation. They may not be out, they may not feel safe to be out, but they are there. And um, raising awareness of those stories, I think, is so important. And then having a conversation around theology and using some of the resources we have, like Mark Wingfield's, you know, why the church needs to talk about sexuality, or, um, or David Gushy's, you know, changing our mind, or Unclobber. Those kind of things can really walk you through the theology piece. But I think, um, I think stories are so powerful, above all. It's hard for me to think about because I've not been there for so long. Uh, and I know not everybody could probably be this way, but maybe if you could be that um, mischievous, crafty person, first of all, you could talk to your pastor about it. You could have coffee, which I think is fine to have. If your church is one where you write down the prayer request and the pastor reads it, you could just write down, I just pray that we can become fully open and affirming. See if they read it out loud during the church or service or not. You could put that kind of a thing on the Facebook page, comments under the sermon when it's streamed. I don't know. Just agitate, and uh, you could be a thorn in the side. Not everybody could do that. This person looks like she's doing that. 
Um, but you need some people to be that way. She's our rebel rouser. You got to work up to that. Yeah, I think, uh, Sarah, didn't you say something like that recently? Like, if you're in a non-affirming church, um, they should either be asking you to speak or asking you to leave. Yeah. 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 We need to write that down. That's... Yeah, if you, um, you know, talk... I don't know, Liz. Liz said it. But they should, you should be talking about it to such a degree that they either ask you to preach it from the pulpit or ask you to leave. I think that's something... that. So let's just broach kind of a tender subject because you and I, about once every three months, get aggravated about this and we punch in a post. You, you do it or I do it. And we always have to kind of back off and explain. But we, I, I do get aggravated at people who are supposedly fully celebrating affirming repentant who are staying quietly in a non-affirming church. That feels like um, they're co-conspiring in the diminishment of people that they supposedly love. I, I, I do agree that there are cases where it's good to stay. People ask me all the time, how can I help my church? I, you can help your church by leaving. Mm-hmm. You can help. I, I understand the UMC Big Tent thing, but you can help your denomination by leaving. I'm not saying it's the only way. You can help. Um, preachers do watch attendance. They do watch tithe numbers. It is possible to really help by leaving. It's, I, I do agree. Liz and I will back off. It is possible to stay. But if you stay, you can't stay silently. And if you leave, you can't leave silently. You can't you leave. You have to stay while you're leaving. Yes. That's, that's the deal. I, I don't have a lot of tolerance for supposedly affirming people who are staying quietly and protecting their relationships that they don't want to give up. There, there has to be... I mean... How many opportunities do we have in the West to do anything that approximates taking up a cross and doing something connected to the gospel that cost us? This is one. So. Well, and, and I would say as a family who has an LGBTQ um, loved one, we need you to either be in affirming churches or we need you to be making a ruckus a little bit in your affirming church. I mean, your are not affirming church. Um, I mean, we need you. People are... I mean, I really believe that people's spiritual health is hanging in the balance, not just their mental and physical well-being, but also their spiritual well-being. And, you know, that's something I want everyone to think about. It's really important that we consider the people who are losing their faith and walking away from the church and um, feel spiritually unhealthy and wounded and harmed they need something from us and those of us who love them need something from you too they deserve it you know one of the things that's emerging here um, and i think it's important to to name it is um, we're not talking about a theological difference Um, this is not one of those sort of you know conversations where you have a difference about a theological principle and you just go back and forth and it doesn't really we're talking about harm people are being harmed severely Um, And so the importance of being able, as you're talking about, to be willing to raise, raise a ruckus. Um, There's that's a whole that's holy work. Well, and by doing that, you may be able to reach somebody that somebody like me could never reach as a gay woman. As an ally, they you may have more influence, and I think that's important as well to be able to raise that and to and to take the bullets for us, so we have don't have to keep on defending our existence to the world all the time. That's exhausting and traumatizing in itself. Thank you. Well, thank you for saying that, and I would like maybe an address or something. Maybe we can send a card of thanks or just acknowledgement yeah. to that senior. I would love that. And I just had a thought, an epiphany, and I'm going to start doing this, Pastor Kayla and Grace Point, is that we could tithe to the affirming churches. Uh, whether we go there or not, we could put tithe there because one of the first things that I heard when, as I entered into this arena is that the queer community has lost their sense of belonging. Those who have lost, um, who uh, just been alienated from their church families, that was such a a sense of belonging to them. And a lot of them fortunately get plugged in because we have a place to point them to. But consider giving, which I haven't. I just popped in my head. It's like, I'm going to do that. And there's a second thing. It's gone. It's gone. 
I'm gonna stop s- tithing to the non-affirming churches. Yeah. Because <laughs> that's how they keep perpetuating the system. Something that I did that I know not everybody could do, I guess I was just in a situation where I was able to do it, is um, I received my first call to be a pastor. They knew I was queer, but I told them, and I, it was an associate pastor position, so I was not the only pastor in that church, but I told them, I'm sorry, I'm not going to officiate weddings for some couples until I can officiate them for all couples. And I stuck to it, I stuck to it and not everyone was happy about that. Um, but also I was engaged and I didn't want to give rights to other couples that I couldn't even have myself. And um, then it happened. And then it was a big celebration when I got to go down to the courthouse and register my credentials and do all these weddings. Um, so that, I mean, like I, I leveraged that piece of power and I know not everybody can do that, but it was something. Well, I mean, it's listening to some of this, it reminds me that our faith, by very nature, is subversive. Um, and Jesus, like in his teaching of turn the other cheek, of go the extra mile, mm-hmm. that, that, those are subversive tactics for dealing with oppression while not becoming an oppressor, right? It's beautiful. It's subversive. And so what I'm hearing here is, like, there, there are no steps, three things that will work for everybody, but be creative, Again, I, um, two things. I've got to slip off and take a phone call from a child from home. Anna, would you take my spot? Another pastor, she can fill in for me. But I, I just helped the church make their statement, their final statement to their church about inclusion. And they used the repentant language, and they reversed their language. They, in, the, in the original statement, they said, we are now inviting our LGBTQ plus brothers and sisters to the table. And they changed that to we have now decided to join our LGBTQ brothers and sisters at the table. We are not inviting them. Now think about it. We are not inviting them to the Lord's table. If you know anything about Jesus' table life, we're the ones that are finally coming to the table. They have been there with Jesus outside of the institution at the Lord's table the whole time. So we're joining them. Anna Galladay, y'all know who she is. You can Hi, Anna. Way to go, Anna. (laughs) So, Anna, welcome. I'm sure you planned for this. I did. Um, I was very prepared. So, uh, since you're you're just here joining us, uh, you've been back there. I know you've been thinking. Anything you want to share as you come up here? I mean, I'll start by just sharing. Many of you know me, but I am a United Methodist pastor who lost my credentials in 2018 because I did a same-gender wedding. And... I'm still ineligible for reappointment in the UMC until we determine that we are willing to split. And I have a segment of my denominational church that will allow me um, not to get away with things, but give me full permission to engage with my parishioners the way that I believe Jesus called me to. A couple of things came to mind, and I, I am, I'm really just kind of piggying back on, so forgive me if I'm like going back 15 minutes, but there are some of you, I think, that will say, it sounds like a really great idea to leave, but for any number of reasons. I'm, you know, fourth or fifth generation in this church. I um, am on the vestry. I'm a part of the board. I'm, I am all the things, and, and there, are, there are ties that are keeping me to this community that are not as easy to sever as um, being subversive might ask me to be, there are small and subversive ways you can start this. If your church refuses to enter into a conversation around um, queer celebration, um, would you be willing to start a supper club or a Sunday school class that would? Would there be a space on Sunday morning where you could gather with other like-minded people within your congregation to actually have these conversations? If it can't be within the building, then have it be on a Friday night in your home where you invite the people from your, fam- from your church family or your community that are willing to have these hard conversations and to kind of strategize and simply be with one another about what the next step is in this. 
I think so oftentimes we think we have to do this work alone or we think we're the only people that are thinking it or we think, ah, oh, well, there's like three or four families and like what are we going to be able to do in a church of 200? The answer may not be something that gets you to a very quick solution, but it simply may be your need to be in community with one another that actually helps transform others around you that are seeing what's happening and seeing this difference that it's making in the families that you're a part of. Um, the other thing that I would offer, piggying back on the language conversation that we had, is language is not only important in the way that we name things like inclusion and celebration, but it's also important in your liturgy, and it's important in your signage, and it's important in all the things that people see when they come into these spaces. Do you have a bathroom that is safe for any person that walks into your sanctuary or your fellowship hall? Do you have that space? If the answer is no, then you're nowhere close to being able to welcome anyone into it. I mean, it's quite frankly, it's BS if you think that welcoming someone into your congregation when they physically can't urinate, it's not, it's not a solution. You're, you're not there. Um, the other thing I would offer is language in your liturgy. In your liturgy. Um, I mean, I, I, I'm a straight white cis woman who was highly triggered at Beer and Hems last night because of the patriarchal language that we continue to allow in these traditional hems that many of us know and love. I mean, I'm a seventh generation United Methodist. And to hear words like father and um, him and words around creator that really stigmatize the capacity for humans that don't identify as male or him or have those pronouns, a really good question to ask somebody at your church or ask the pastor if you're going to have coffee is how do you start the Lord's Prayer? If their answer is our Father who art in heaven, ding, 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 ding. Can they say our Creator? Can you, there are so many ways that we can easily and subversively transfer these kinds of things into ways that are productive. Um, and so those are the things I'd offer. Thank you. Thank you. Well, and it's, I mean, just the point you make there, it's really important that we're thinking and that we're paying attention. We, those of us who've been in this world a long time, we, can, we just can go on autopilot and not realize what we're doing is actually compounding harm for folks. So before we open it up for questions, anybody have anything you want to share? Um, sort of, not, not as a parting, uh, maybe, yeah, maybe as a parting, I and mean, you, you get to answer questions too, but anything you want to make sure you, you get to share? Well, I want to piggyback on Anna. We can almost all go home now, because that was great. <laughs> but I, I was thinking as I looked uh, about these beautiful people, that are we preaching to the choir here? Because, we're, hello, we're at Wild Goose, right? But what I thought of is something I heard this morning. Um, there's someone every month on their calendar, once a month, they have written on their calendar for each month, call Congress. And that's one day a month that they call Congress and either give thanks for a good job they're doing or complain about something. Well, what if we had that mindset of if you're outside the church or if we're preaching to the choir here, why don't you go down a local listing of your churches in your area and call and just maybe start a dialogue. We're here, you know, you're, you're getting the resources that you need, you're finding the language, you're finding your voice. Have that conversation. Just because you're outside of the non-affirming church or not even going, it doesn't mean that there's still really dangerous things happening on the street corner. Do you understand what I'm saying? And then um, there's a second thing. Oh, God. Um, <laughs> Call them and, oh my gosh, this is how it's going to be. Sarah did this recently in our town. Um, there was a, ma a mayor who declared June month as Pride Month in a very conservative, smaller section of the town. And she and a lot of the pastors went and publicly thanked the mayor because he got it real bad from all the other people in the town. But to highlight voices of thank you was a big deal. And to let other people know, you know, just 
Because a lot of people have no idea that conversion therapy is still happening. If you're outside of that, you just don't even know it. Well, we need to be aware of what's still going on and we'll continue until we end it once and for all. But it starts with us, so be that person. And reach out to the LGBTQ people in your life, you know, people that have lost family members or faith communities and bring them alongside you and take them to dinner and include them in your holidays and those kind of things. Those are so helpful for people that have lost their community and uh, whether that's faith community or family or relatives, you know, like they, they need a place to belong. They need a place to feel home. So, so do that and help plug them into a safe space. Find, you know, connect people to mama bears, connect people to local affirming churches. I lead the Unashamed Love Collective, which is an online private community. You know, like plug them in somewhere where they're gonna feel safe and find like-minded people where they can be themselves. And I was just gonna add that um, I think it's really important if we have um, classes or committees that are working uh, to lead a church from non-affirming to affirming that we have LGBTQ people involved in those conversations, leading those conversations. As, I mean, I, I've been in this conversation a long time. I've been doing this work a long time. I work with thousands of families and I'm still learning. I don't always get it. I'm, I'm not coming from the perspective of a group of people that are marginalized and oppressed and, and been excluded. And I need to listen to those voices uh, in order to know how to make my community, um, you know, comfortable and, and a place where LGBTQ people feel like they can just relax and be themselves. Thank you. Questions, we have a few minutes. Thank you, I'm so sorry that that was an experience that you had to have. I think that I think that our churches have become so s compelled to speak about eternal life and our destination after death that we forget about the call that Jesus gave to us in the Lord's prayer to actually create heaven here on earth. And if we look at the way that we are to be not, not how we are to live so that we are to, to go to glory in a certain time or fashion or, or with a certain process and checking all the boxes off, but to actually create heaven on earth here. Heaven on earth here looks like a community that Jesus would have fed along the lake. It looks like a community that Jesus would have called out of a tree. It looks like a community that Jesus would have blessed with sores all over their body. And we are, we are too quick to say um, where you are going after you are dead is more important than how we create heaven on earth here. And I would surmise that if you could find a way to coalesce those communities around a vision of heaven on earth, what does that look like in your midst? What does that look like in real time? You might find a nugget of goodness that you could all bind around in order to negate your differences or at least leave them aside for those moments and actually start to generate something holy. Amen. I have one more seed to plant. It's okay. totally kind of random, but um, if this happens, uh, grab hold of it because it's a seed that uh, I whatever. So I got to my church and uh, I found out that one of our church members, a gay man, was incarcerated. And so I went to go meet him in the prison and he asked, he was like, we have so many Christian churches that do ministries in this prison, like 70 different services a week, but not see one single one of them are open and affirming. Could you have our church come do an open and affirming worship service in the prison? So we did. And some of those folks, there was like 40 people, and I'll say people because it's a men's prison, but there were transgender women incarcerated there. And then uh, as happens, some of these inmates were transferred to other prisons. And so we had contacts in all these other prisons. And so now our church is doing open and affirming worship services in other prisons. And there's like, okay, a population of 1,400 in a prison, there's like 70 plus queer folks. There's so many, and there's not one single open and affirming service at that prison. So if you have that opportunity, it's really untapped, and I want to invite you to take hold of that. Fantastic. Can we thank our panel? Thanks for being here.